Oversight and government reform will come to order, and without objection, the Chair is authorized to declare a recess at any time. We have an important hearing today. Um, it, is, it should be noted that uh, Democratic leadership races uh, elections are going on right now, but through mutual agreement with Mr. Uh, Cummings and their staff, uh, we have agreed to go ahead and start this hearing, and uh, as soon as that election is done, uh, they will come join us. Uh, but we did so with um, uh, a mutual understanding that we would start. There are the requisite number of members here to start this, but we, uh, I don't think I have ever started one without at least uh, one member of the Democratic uh, uh, minority here, um, but we are starting it uh, through mutual agreement. Uh, today's hearing is about the uh, oversight of the Drug Enforcement Agency's Confidential Source Program. And one of the most important tasks that our government has is to keep us safe, and there are a number of ways through a number of different agencies that this is done. Uh, we employ a number of tools to gather information, including uh, human intelligence, human sources. And the Drug Enforcement Agency is one agency that uses these human sources to gather information on the illegal drug trafficking. While the nation is uh, suffering through one of the deepest uh, and, and most uh, a horrific opioid uh, epidemics, uh, the, uh, the work done by the DA is very important. There are thousands of really good men and women who put their lives on the line to do very important work, work that is furthered by confidential informants on a daily basis. Yet the DEA has struggled with the management of its confidential source program. The American people through Congress have appropriated uh, millions of dollars to help them do their jobs and get the information that they need. But back in 2005, the Inspector General called for the DEA to improve its oversight by monitoring of its confidential sources in several areas. Specifically, the Inspector General reported the agency failed to properly track its confidential sources, resulting in paying sources well after they provided to be useful. So here we are about a decade, use, uh, decade later, and here is the big fear. The DEA wasn't listening and they didn't implement. And if they did, at least based on this report, they did an exceptionally poor job. So, according to the uh, Inspector General, between fiscal year 2010 and 2015, the DEA had more than 18,000 confidential sources in the United States. But these, aren't, these sources don't necessarily give up the goods for free. They want something in return. From 2010 to 2015, the DEA paid some $237 million to 9,000, or roughly half of its confidential sources. The average payment per source is roughly $26,000. When an agency is spending taxpayer dollars, it must get the most bang for the buck. We ask these men and women to make uh, decisions on what the costs of these types of informants might be. The DEA, according to the Inspector General, paid 477, quote, limited use sources, end quote, that the DEA, DEA deemed as relatively low risk an estimated $26.8 million. That is an average payment of more than $56,000. To sources who were supposed to be providing information to the DEA on a limited and voluntary basis without direction from the DEA. However, it turned out that many of these tipsters were actually working on behalf or in partnership with DEA agents. Other findings from the Inspector General's report, this one just bugs me to no end. The DEA paid $1.5 million to Amtrak and TSA sources for information they could have gotten for free by going through the proper law enforcement channels. In fact, in one case, the DEA paid one Amtrak employee, a United States government employee, $854,460 over 20 years just for sending passenger name records along. $854,000 this person took, one person from Amtrak. The DEA's records were so bad that the Inspector General couldn't determine whether the sources were paid were being reliable. The DEA paid more than $9 million to old informants that were no longer considered active, despite a policy against paying deactivated informants. The DEA provided Federal benefits, including workers' comp, to confidential sources with no process or controls on how these benefits were awarded. And finally, the DEA was 
uncooperative with the Inspector General throughout much of the investigation. Nothing but nothing will frustrate Congress more than limited access by the, for the Inspector General. You know, we're, I say this almost every day now. We're different in the United States of America. We're different. We are self-critical. We do look under the hood. We do have people come in and audit things. We do it in the spirit of making things better. There is no reason that I can think of that the DEA should ever hold any information back from the Inspector General's office, and I want to hear the answer to that. Um, it's just terribly frustrating, and it's wrong. The Department of Justice Inspector General also pointed out another boondoggle by the DEA in a joint venture with the Department of Defense. The purpose of the 2008 program was to procure and modify an aircraft for surveillance operations in Afghanistan in 2012. After eight years and millions of dollars wasted, at la the last report, uh, the plane sits in Delaware, inoperable, resting on jacks. The program has resulted in the government paying $86 million, four times what it was supposed to, for a plane that was supposed to be ready in 2012 and it's still not flying. In fact, it's projected to be ready in 2017 and will never fly the mission it was intended for originally in Afghanistan. Despite the program's delay and expanding budget, 14 senior managers, and this is what, you, again, we can have to explain this to me. Here we have a plane that's approaching $100 million that isn't flying wasn't used in Afghanistan, and the 14 senior managers responsible for the program received a combined $1 million in bonuses. How can that be? How do you get a bonus when you screw up? How do you take a $1 million out of the U.S. taxpayers' wallets and give it to 14 managers for a program that spent almost $100 million and doesn't work? We love the men and women who work at the DA. It is tough. I have but a, a few times gone out with, with uh, agents like this and our local law enforcement and watched them go through this. It is dangerous. It is tough. It doesn't get enough pat on, patting on the back. But ladies and gentlemen, we can't waste the American taxpayer dollars to this degree. Should we be paying for confidential informants? I think yes. Should we be giving one Amtrak employee $850 plus thousand dollars to hand over a list of passengers? No. And that taints the entire agency, the reputation of the good men and women who work there. But we have to answer these questions and we want to get some answers to this. So, okay. Uh, we now like to uh, recognize actually Mr. Lynch, uh, a gentleman from Massachusetts, for an opening statement. Mr. Lynch, you now recognize. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you so much. I had written uh, a letter uh, some time ago. I know we had a full schedule on this committee, but uh, I want to look at uh, confidential informants. So I, I really am truly thankful uh, for your willingness to take up this issue. It's, a, it's an important one, and uh, not just for the DEA, but for Department of Justice in general. Uh, so I have some legislation. We went through this uh, quite a bit in, in, in the City of Boston in the uh, investigation of organized crime in the Boston office of the FBI. Uh, we ended up with about 19 murders committed by some folks who were uh, informants and, and acting in conjunction with the Boston office of the FBI. Some of the agents went to jail. Special agent in charge Conley went to jail, uh, still there. So uh, the use of confidential informants is, is, is in darkness right now, and uh, my bill and maybe we can incorporate it with some of the chairman's ideas, would be to require the uh, Department of Justice to give us a list of all the confidential informants being used by the Department of Justice and agencies under its purview. So it would not only be DEA, it would also be the FBI. I had a conversation. We brought in uh, Senator Grassley, myself, and some others brought in the FBI to talk about their confidential informant program, and I asked for a list of all the confidential informants that the FBI was operating right now and the amount of money that they were spending in maintaining these uh, confidential informants. And the special agent in charge who came in uh, to talk to us, his jaw dropped and he said, sir, that would be thousands and thousands of, of reports. 
So all that money and all that activity out there, and you've got confidential informants that are committing serious crimes. In, in our case, we had, we had, as I said before, we had 19 murders, and that's not all. They've got a situation down in New York and also another situation in New England that uh, we've got confidential informants out there that are committing major crimes against innocent citizens uh, while they're under the protection of the FBI. So we need to blow the lid off this. And we need to know what the taxpayer, and this is all happening sub rosa. There's not a whole lot going on here. There's some guidelines. Uh, uh, Janet Reno, former Attorney General, God bless her, has some guidelines for confidential informants. Those are being ignored, at least in the cases that we've looked at. So uh, I think this is an area where Republicans and Democrats can work together. I really do. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's a good thing for America to have transparency around these issues. Uh, and, and I think we can really make some mean, a meaningful difference in the way uh, law enforcement is using confidential informants in our, in our society. With that, Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you for your indulgence. We have, a, we have a, a caucus election going on, so that's why there's nobody else here. We're all in, in caucus. Uh, but uh, we'll try to jump back in uh, periodically. Thank you for your indulgence, and I yield back the balance of my time. I thank the gentleman. We'll hold the record open for five legis legislative days for any members who would like to submit a written statement. We'll now recognize our one and only panel of witnesses. We're pleased to welcome Mr. Rob Patterson, who is the Chief of Inspections at the Drug Enforcement Agency. Um, we also have uh, the Honorable Michael Horowitz, Inspector General at the Department of Justice, uh, who we've had uh, a number of times before the committee. Uh, we appreciate the two, you two gentlemen uh, joining us here today. As you know, it's committee rules uh, that pursuant uh, that we all witnesses are to be sworn before they testify. So if you please rise and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Uh, let the record reflect that the witnesses both answered in the affirmative. We would appreciate you limiting your verbal comments to five minutes. Your entire written record will be made part of the record. Uh, Mr. Patterson, you are now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, sir. Chairman Chaffetz, Ranking Member Cummings, and the distinguished members of the committee. On behalf of the approximately 9,000 employees of the Drug Enforcement Administration, thank you for the opportunity to be here today to discuss DEA's confidential source program and the enhancements made to our policies as a result of reviews and recommendations by both the Office of the Inspector General and the U.S. Government Accountability Office. DEA's mission to identify, investigate, disrupt, and dismantle the world's most significant drug trafficking organizations responsible for the production and distribution of illicit drugs. To that end, we work closely with our law enforcement counterparts by following the evidence wherever it leads. Central to this mission is a worldwide confidential source network, <clears throat> which uniquely positions DEA to act quickly, effectively, and proactively to reach beyond our borders to identify and investigate those who threaten the safety and interest of our country's citizens, both home and abroad. We recognize there can be inherent risks in using these sources, and these risks must be regularly and carefully balanced against their benefits. With the responsibility of running a CS program, it is critical to have a strong foundation of clear policies and procedures to ensure a complete understanding by our investigative workforce. Policy alone, however, is not enough to remedy the concerns raised by these reviews. Management at all level share a tremendous amount of responsibility and must provide significant and sufficient oversight. Senior field leadership must also create an environment that stresses compliance and properly assesses these inherent risks. DEA headquarters also shares responsibility for ensuring effective policy, processing and tracking of CS information, and monitoring, the audit and, monitoring and auditing the use of CSs in the field. Collectively, we must always strive to do better. I am both pleased and proud to advise DEA has made and continues to make significant efforts in improving our program. We have agreed with all of OIG and GAO's recommendations for our CS program. We have acknowledged our shortfalls and are actively working with all appropriate parties to make improvements. We endeavor to faithfully execute our mission with excellence and integrity. Our culture is a healthy and a good one, and the vast majority of DEA employees perform their job to the highest standards. Under Acting Administrator Rosenberg's leadership, we have made tremendous strides in the manner in which we effectively and transparently address these issues and concerns about the conduct of our employees and the manner in which we carry out our mission. 
One of the largest hurdles that hindered DEA from that goal prior to his arrival was a lack of staffing in key leadership positions. This created a vacuum of senior leadership and fostered a culture of acting leaders. Among these vacant positions were the Chief Inspector, the Deputy Chief Inspectors in the Office of Professional Responsibility, the Office of Inspections, and Security Programs, which collectively made up the entire leadership of DEA's Inspection Division. These positions, along with other DES SES positions, have since been filled. I note the Inspections Division leadership because the Office of Inspections plays a key role in ensuring the requirements of the CS program are carried out in accordance with established policy and procedure. Over the past year, we have made a concerted effort to revise the inspection process to take a deeper look at high-risk programs such as the CS program. These changes range from modifications as basic as the revision of inspection checklist to the more robust review of CS documentation to ensure the proper use, approvals, and sound justifications for payments. The Office of Inspections also works closely with DEA's new Office of Compliance, which was established earlier this year. The Office of Compliance includes a policy administration section, which is currently reviewing all of DEA's policy manuals, working with our chief counsel and program offices, as well as fellow law enforcement agencies to review and revise existing policies governing DEA's operations. Finally, where misconduct is alleged, those instances must be thoroughly investigated. In CS-related issues, the Office of Professional Responsibility is charged with not only addressing the specific allegation against an employee, but examining the roles of management and providing significant and sufficient oversight. OPR conducts these investigations in close coordination with and in deference to the OIG. As appropriate where the managers have failed in their duties and properly, supervise, or properly not supervising their employees or have failed to ensure the necessary oversight in program areas, they are being held accountable. The DEA has always been committed to serving the public and fulfilling our mission. We are very proud of our accomplishments. Thus, it is never easy to hear about the weaknesses in our programs and see them identified or to hear about our past lack of cooperation during these reviews. The current administration has worked diligently to address policy gaps and program programmatic shortcomings, filled leadership positions, implemented new training and placed increased emphasis on our leaders for greater oversight. We fully believe these outsider reviews by OIG and others make us better. From our previous discussions with your staff and today's conversation, I hope you will recognize DEA's commitment to positive change in our agency. I want to thank you for your time today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Uh, Inspector General Horowitz, you are now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Cummings, members of the committee. Uh, thank you for inviting me to testify today. Proper oversight of the DEA's confidential sources programs is critical, given the amount of money paid to informants, approximately $237 million during a recent five-year period, and the inherent risks associated with the program to the public safety, to privacy, and civil rights. My office recently issued two audits, uh, finding that DEA faces significant challenges in managing its confidential sources program. Our July 2015 report determined that DEA's policies allowed the use of high-risk sources without the review required by Attorney General guidelines, and that DEA failed to always review long-term sources consistent with its own policies. We also found that DEA paid certain sources substantial disability benefits without determining it had a clear legal basis to do so and without establishing any procedures or controls. We made seven recommendations to rectify these issues. Since our report, DEA has issued new policies and we have closed five of those recommendations. We will continue to monitor closely DEA's efforts to address the two remaining open recommendations. In September 2016, we issued a second report and found that DEA needed to significantly improve the overall management and oversight of its confidential sources program. We determined that DEA did not adequately oversee payments to its sources, increasing the potential for waste, fraud, and abuse. For example, while DEA policy prohibits paying certain deactivated sources, we found two concerning instances of such payments. We further found that DEA failed to appropriately track all confidential source activity, did not document proper justifications for all source payments, and at times did not adequately safeguard traveler information it was collecting. Additionally, we found that DEA condoned the use of subsources 
yet had no controls, policies, or procedures in place to oversee them. Separately, we identified significant problems with DEA's use of what it calls limited use sources. DEA policy specifically uh, specifies that limited use sources make information available to the DEA independently and without direction. However, we found that some DEA units were in fact instructing limited use sources about what information to provide and what actions to take. Among DEA's limited use sources were Amtrak and Transportation Security Administration employees. As the Chairman mentioned, during the five-year period covered in our audit, DEA used at least 33 Tram Amtrak employees and eight TSA employees as sources paying them a total of over $1.5 million. Yet we determined that DEA was entitled to receive this information at no cost, thereby wasting government funds. We also found that DEA's Intelligence Division has conducted limited management, oversight, and tracking of source payments. For example, it does not independently validate the credibility of its sources or the accuracy of the information they provide. In addition, DEA was enabled to provide us with an itemized list and overall total of payments to intelligence-related sources who we determined were paid more than $30 million. Our report made seven recommendations uh, in our September 2016 report, and we expect an update from DEA next month on the steps it has taken to address them. Finally, I want to acknowledge the serious commitment that current DEA management and program officials have made to improve the confidential source program and to implement appropriate controls. These problems did not happen overnight, and correcting them will require a dedicated and sustained effort. To date, senior DEA management has shown its willingness to do so, and we will obviously monitor their efforts in this regard. This concludes my prepared statement, and I would be pleased to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, thank you. We will now recognize the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Wahlberg, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to the panel for being here, uh, and, and thanks uh, for the work you do. Um, Inspector General Horowitz, um, your, your report found, as you have indicated, that there uh, was a relationship created with DEA agents in some limited use. Uh, confidential sources that would, went beyond simply being a person who gives tips, um, to rather be being in a partnership on behalf of and part of uh, the DEA process. Um, what are the uh, privacy concerns um, with DEA essentially uh, treating these sources as independent contractors and asking them to perform specific tasks? Well, there are several, Congressman, one being that uh, among what we found was the requests were for various traveler records, personal information, itineraries um, of travel for various um, transportation uh, companies, um, collecting that information, not only collecting the information generally by directing people to do so, that's the first question. The second being, how is that information then protected? We had serious concerns about that. The third being little to no information being available on whether the collection of that information was useful in total. We can find evidence when DEA actually successfully interdicted drugs or what they believed was improper cash uh, uh, transportation, but they did not keep records on what the overall success rate was. We don't know, for example, whether they were batting 1,000 or batting 0 0.50. Um, and that is a concern, because if you are going to ask for the collection of large amounts of records, I think the public wants to know that there is some success associated with that. And I know that is a concern we have talked about in the asset seizure context, and, and that is precisely what is potentially presented here. Be, beyond the evaluation of success or failure, what other, other dangers do you see with this, uh, this process? Well, one uh, that also comes up is the Fourth Amendment issue. Okay. Um, if the sources, if individuals in the public act independently and want to call their police, their DEA office, the FBI, whomever, on their own, 
They are obviously entitled to do that, and of course, I think we would all hope they would do so if they saw illegal activity. It is a very different analysis if people are acting as the agent of the law enforcement agency. And incentivized to do that. And are incentivized to do that and are incentivized in some cases quite substantially. Okay. Um, as, as you know and you expressed that, uh, I have had concern, long, long standing concern with the civil asset forfeiture issue and asset forfeiture in general. Um, it appears uh, when I came, came across the fact that there, uh, there was a an individual, a confidential source uh, working in the parcel industry um, that had the ability to open packages, but it came to be that they opened packages but only reported not on drugs or anything else but simply on cash. Um, are you concerned that the DEA's policies are warping priorities by prioritizing asset forfeiture uh, rather than the seizure of drugs? That, that is a concern and, in fact, we have an ongoing uh, review of the Department and, in particular, the DEA's use of asset seizures, and I am looking forward to issuing that in the near future, in part it grows out of some of the concerns that you have addressed and other members of the Committee have mentioned on that issue. Has DEA taken any steps to remedy this problem that you are aware of? Um, they have taken some steps, and we have gotten some updates about their intentions on collecting more information that will, would allow, for example, the DEA, most importantly, and us uh, as well in our oversight role, to determine what is occurring, how frequently it is occurring, the success or failures, um, the incentivization or not of folks. I think there are several steps that are Mr. Patterson, could you, could you address that? Absolutely, sir. So certainly we appreciate the OIG's review of this. It is an important area. Uh, I, I will say simply we are working diligently on the limited use policy. Um, it has now fallen under certain AG guidelines that it did not used to fall under the six-year six review. I share his concerns as well related to Fourth Amendment violations or issues that may come up from such issues as the parcel interdiction. Uh, we have continued to look at training and making sure our employees are aware, and I think probably the most important issue that we are looking at is the changes to the limited use uh, category to make it more robust and, and possibly moving that into a regular use informant as opposed to a limited use informant. Okay, thank you. I, I yield back. Thank you. And I'll recognize the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Meadows, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you uh, both for being here. Mr. Horwitz, it's, it's good to have you back with us. Uh, and as you can recall, some of our previous hearings have been uh, uh, rather illuminating, I guess, would be the best way to say that. And so I, I want to focus a little bit on access, uh, because the Inspector General uh, and your ability to do your job is only uh, commensurate with your ability to access information. We have had some problems, as you well know. We have had some problems not only with the DEA, but we have had some problems in other agencies uh, with access, and it is something that this committee will not tolerate, as you know. Uh, so can you share with me uh, where we are on access in, uh, with the DEA specifically, uh, maybe where we have been where we are today? Absolutely. And I uh, very much appreciate, as I know the whole IG community does, this committee's commitment to ensuring that fix and passing the IG Empowerment Act, which would address these issues. And I am hopeful in the next week or so we can get it through the Senate as well. Well, that's where I was going, you know, and so you didn't swing and a miss with uh, that softball that I teed up for you there. But I, I, I do b believe that, and so maybe you can speak to the critical nature of that particular piece of legislation on how it could have helped in this situation and other similar situations. So we identified what I think it's fair to say, and DA has also acknowledged in both of our reports, very serious concerns in a lot of different areas. Our ability to find that information was delayed by about a year because we, we actually started this audit or both of these audits almost three years ago. February will be three years. The first year, my auditors can explain in great detail how little they had to do because of how many roadblocks were thrown up in front of them. That has changed, I am pleased to report, dramatically with the new leadership, the acting administrator, 
the, the leadership of OPR. We so what you are saying is the resignation of the previous administrator who came under fire for a variety of issues, this new administrator is doing a better job? The, the new acting administrator has done a much better job, and we have gotten the materials that we needed to do these reports in the last almost 18 months now. But that first year was delayed seriously, and it demonstrates why we need the IG Empowerment Act. It shouldn't be up to who sits in the chair in the corner office of the components we oversee or any other IG oversees as to whether we get access to records. All right. So would you say, without uh, disparaging the reputation of a previous administrator, would you say that there are typically conflicting uh, priorities as it relates to access for administrators because they want to not share that they are doing a bad job uh, in a particular area? That is certainly the risk, and it, it should never be up to the person who is being reviewed by us and whether their conduct was appropriate to decide what they think we should look at. So it would be someone who is accused of a crime who would say that they could withhold evidence legally if we do not pass this act. Would you agree with that analogy? I can assure you as an AUSA, my, having in my former life and working with agents, I can't imagine a circumstance where the agents would say to the subjects or targets of a criminal investigation, you decide what we should see so that we can figure out whether you committed a crime. All right. So the IG Empowerment Act would give you most of the tools, you believe, uh, to be able to make sure that we not only have a transparent and accountable uh, government, but empower the IGs to be able to better do their job, not just at DOJ, but across the spectrum of... Exactly correct. There are 73 IGs out there, and many of them have faced, unfortunately, the same issues we did. All right. So, Mr. Patterson, let me come to you, because obviously something has changed, and Mr. Horowitz is uh, being complimentary in, in spite of the fact that we are here today over some very troubling concerns that the Chairman has illuminated. What individual uh, policies or, or rules have you changed, or has the acting administrator changed to make sure that access is not an issue? It, well, certainly uh, our, our current acting administrator has made it very clear, uh, and I, I feel in a similar fashion, that these reviews, whether it is OIG or any reviews from the Department, make us better. Um, so we embrace that and we will fully comply with that. I mean, I, I will say we have uh, worked with OIG my first few months after taking over this job uh, to rebuild this relationship with the various components uh, that fall under Mr. Horowitz. Um, we put out guidance to the field uh, in terms of, and we worked again to, to put that guidance out jointly uh, to the field as to how they are to respond and, and, and provide information to the OIG to properly inform. So would you agree, and I'll yield back, uh, would you agree then at this particular point, without the implementation of a legislative fix, uh, the IG Empowerment Act, that it is up to the individual discretion of an administrator on how they comply and whether they comply, uh, and you uh, would agree that there should be some continuity there. And I'll yield back to the Chairman. I would. So to follow up on Mr. Meadows' question, what do you believe you don't have to share with the Inspector General? Sir, nothing. I mean, there is, there is at, at this point, I don't believe there is anything. I mean, there are safeguards on sharing information with them that is sensitive that they then must uphold uh, and protect. Sure. Um, so at this point, under the current administration of DEA, uh, there is nothing that we will not share with them. Mr. Horowitz, is that the way you are finding it right now? That is correct. And in fact, we are going to have a follow-up report that this committee will get and others on the classified use of informants, and we have been getting access very good. to the classified information. So it has been a very significant change. But the impact and why the IG right. Empowerment Act is needed is clear. This was delayed a year. We could have been here a year ago trying to fix these problems, right? right. What happened in that one-year period? There were some additional payments, by the way, that sure. you have highlighted. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate it, Mr. Beth. We will now recognize the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Heiss, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me just follow up on this. It sounds like there, there's some progress being made, certainly, and that's, that's good news. But, uh, Mr. Horowitz, by the way, thank you for being back with us. Um, last, um, last time you were here, you expressed very serious concern and frustration 
over the employees of the DEA who were holding, withholding information. And uh, some of those individuals, it appears, had actually been told to um, not share information. And in fact, I recall asking then uh, Administra Administrator Leonhardt about this, and she had no satisfactory answer mm -hmm. about that. So uh, are you saying today, a year later, that that issue has been resolved? Is there any shape, form, or fashion in which you are still experiencing this problem? We don't have anything currently. There was, in the last year plus, one slight blip I can recall that I had to reach out to the Acting Administrator or to, the, or to Mr. Patterson, and it was fixed immediately. But I think the message has gotten through from what my staff tells me that um, we are getting compliance. And my folks know, in light of the battles we fought over the last five years, that if there is the slightest hesitation on a component, to give us what they need, and they need to let me know so I can let you all know. How much of this would you attribute to new leadership? I, a substantial amount, and that is, again, going back to the issue. Th th that should not be deciding what we get. I can't imagine anybody would want to see that be the deciding factor, is who is the administrator, or the attorney general, or, the, or you can pick whatever department agency you would want. Okay. Well, th w this Positive. Mr. Patterson, how would you now describe the communication between DEA and the Inspector General? I, I view it as outstanding. Again, uh, uh, you know, not that we Would you speak a, a little more uh, direct? Yeah, bring it. Yeah. Not, not that we have a, uh, you know, a relationship out of, uh, of friendship. I mean, there's a relationship out of necessity for the efforts they do. Um, but I frequently have conversations with all of his staff. Uh, our people in both the Inspections Division and OPR enjoy a, a good relationship with their folks. They are communicating well. Uh, again, and I, I think I probably recall the instance, we had a personality issue some time ago. Uh, it should never be that Mr. Horowitz even has to reach out to anybody at DEA. It should be dealt with at the appropriate level. It was. It was fixed. And well, I think it is more than a personality issue. There were actually people who were instructed not to pass on information. Has there anyone at the DEA, has anyone been disciplined for uh, directing employees to withhold information from the Inspector General? Uh, not honestly, sir. I, I haven't looked into that. I'm not aware. I would, I would, if you would want, I can go. I, I would want because that's that should never take place uh, for obstruction to be directed to employees, uh, and yet obviously that was taking place. And those who were involved uh, ought to be disciplined in one way or other. Um, all right, with the with the confidential source program, uh, Mr. Horowitz, you brought this up a little while ago. Um, are you satisfied that uh, the recommendations that you have made have been fulfilled? Um, I'm satisfied that there's been progress made. We still have, we've closed some, but there are still. You said five out of seven? Five out of seven on our first report. Okay. We are waiting for the update, which we're supposed to get next month from DA on the status of our most recent recommendation. All right, so supposed to get next month. Mr. Patterson, when can we expect to have those new procedures implemented? I, I, well, so we are implementing them as we can essentially get the fix. And, and I'll go back to a comment that Mr. Horowitz made uh, in his opening. You know, this took us a while to get to the point that we found ourselves in. Uh, we need to properly unwind those issues. Uh, one of the, the concerns we always have is that, you know, policy made in situations where you are doing it as a reaction as opposed to looking at the entire process generally doesn't fix those issues. Uh, so I think we are being thoughtful as we look at this and trying to come to the right and proper solutions. Again, the, the issues that they have pointed out, we share those concerns. Uh, our own inspections division is looking much harder at this program in certain areas at this point. Uh, and with that, we will come to, I think, a, a much better program as well. well. I commend you for the steps you are taking. But again, time frame, when is a general, can you give us a general time frame when you think it will be implemented? So some pieces are, are already being implemented, right? Certain policies are being revised, certain educational programs like with the. So the full compliance, are we talking three months, six months? 
I, I would hope, you know, a six-month time frame, I think, is a, an acceptable window. Is that acceptable to you, Mr. Horowitz? Yeah, we, um, we get an update 90 days after, and we'll continue to get regular updates afterwards. Obviously, it will depend on what we're being told is, if there is a delay, why, and on what issues. But I would say it'll be the, fir the first part will be to correct the policies, but then, of course, education, training is going to be critical to making sure that it's not just a paper program, but it's actually being implemented in, in the culture. Well, thank you, gentlemen, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Uh, thank the gentleman. We'll now recognize the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Russell, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank, uh, thanks to both of our panelists today for the important work that you do in digging into fraud with the taxpayers' dollars. Uh, I do know that you have the best interest in heart as you discover these uh, issues. Mr. Patterson, can you please describe the Global Discovery Program? So, sir, I, I have limited knowledge on this program uh, in my current role, uh, and, and I know that I believe our administrator has met with members already to discuss this and I think is scheduled back for additional meetings. Um, the latest issue on this is we continue to work with the Department of Defense and FAA on getting the proper permits to get this plane from its current location down to DEA's Fort Worth location uh, to essentially determine the future usage of this plane. I, I guess uh, a couple of follow-on questions with that. Uh, you know, this, this French-built ATR-42-500 aircraft, uh, there's a lot of other twin turboprop aircraft that could be used for surveillance other than a 45-passenger plane. Uh, that's often used in commercial aviation. Do you have any idea why a French-built aircraft was selected, uh, being on average uh, millions of dollars more expensive than some other platform? To, to give you the most candid answer I can, I have absolutely no idea why. That might be worth investigating. Uh, and, and while we're going on that loop, um, at, at, at 2008, this aircraft cost, uh, I believe, somewhere in the neighborhood of $8.5 million. Today, they cost around $12 million. We've currently spent, going on now, what, $86 million in modification. How many aircraft could you buy? Ten uh, at the 2008 rate. Uh, were you also aware that there was $6 million worth of damage done to the aircraft as they're trying to install the different radars and cameras that they're not going to be able to install now? I, I am aware that there was damage done. Again, I, I have limited... How was the damage caused? I, I don't know, sir. I, I have limited visibility. I'd, I'd certainly like to take this back and have the right people. Yeah, you know, the FAA, they, I mean, they, they kind of certify, uh, you know, mechanics and things to install and look at things. We, we might want to look at that before we go destroying uh, $8 million aircraft and turning them into $86 million expenditures. $2 million uh, from the DEA, as I understand it, uh, spent on a hangar that will not be used in collaboration with Department of Defense for this aircraft that will not fly uh, and now will not be used uh, in Afghanistan and in addition, there were modifications made to existing hangars in Afghanistan. Can you speak to some of that? Obviously, with the, the downsizing of our workforce in Afghanistan, the, the usage of the plane there wouldn't make practical sense. So has, has anyone considered the downsizing of the airplane? Uh, maybe it's elimination or it's uh, selling and cutting losses. What would be uh, the benefit of having this non-flyable, non-camera operating, non-radar capable, six million dollars worth of damage with installation. You see where we're going here? What, what could possibly, we're talking about 800,000 for an informant here and you know, maybe an abuse of 300,000. This is 86 million dollars. Does anyone see a comparison that maybe this might be something that ought to have a lot more investigation other than Amtrak you know, manifest list? Look, I agree with you, and I believe, and, and Mr. Horowitz may know better than I do, that the DOD is also looking into these issues, but I, I'm not familiar with, with their investigation or what they're doing. I, you know, if, if, Mr. Chairman, this, this is one of the most uh, outrageous things that we have. And, and look, I know you guys are, you're like us. You go pick up the rocks and look at the creepy crawlies underneath them, and we certainly appreciate that, and that's how we find so much of what we find. So th this is not a denigration of your important work. Uh, but this is w what exasperates the American people. Um, U.S. dollars 
I love the French, great people, great ally. They're always there with us, uh, you know, uh, on our endeavors, great foreign policy partner. Uh, we make aircraft in the United States as well, probably a lot cheaper than what we've done. Uh, these are things that we really have to dig into because of all of the items that we've looked at and what you've presented to us this morning, none is as egregious as this. And just the $6 million worth of damage, you know, could go for a lot of pay an Amtrak manifest, you know, to people that don't deserve it that you could get in other ways. So I, I, uh, I would hope that as you pick up the rocks and look at the creepy crawlies, there, there's a lot more rocks on this aircraft issue. And I don't know how we recover from it other than we, we just cut the losses and we move on. But there's a lot more answers that we would like to get uh, regarding the airplane. And thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your indulgence. Thank you. I'll now recognize myself for five minutes. Following up on uh, Mr. Russell's um, question, so Jack Riley, uh, when he was chief of operations, what, what does that mean, chief of operations? He would oversee our operations division. Well, I get that. Come on, put some meat on the bones. What, what, uh, all, all of our enforcement priorities, which would include air wing and, and other areas. So were things going well with the air wing or not going well with the air wing? I, I'm not, I don't have personal knowledge, sir, of, of how things were or weren't working with the air wing at the time that he was the chief of operations. Well, I mean, we just detailed an $86 million boondoggle. A lot of this uh, responsibility goes to the Department of Defense. I, I, I did have a briefing on it, and I, I do buy that. But I'm just struggling to figure out how this person in 2015 got a $36,000 bonus. You know, the American people... We're $19 trillion in debt, and I'm sure he's a good, capable person. But it's just unimaginable that we can somehow justify handing out bonuses by the tens of thousands of dollars. I don't think the American people, the people we were hired to do this job for, I don't think they can look anybody in the eye and say, Tell me why this person should have gotten a $36,000 bonus. Because I tell you what, most of the people in our districts, they aren't getting $36,000 bonuses. They may not be getting $3,600 in bonuses. So when you have a problem that's approaching $100 million and the thing is sitting in the hangar and you're the chief of operations, why should you get a $36,000 bonus? He then also got promoted, right? Now he's the acting dep uh, principal deputy administrator. So what, what do you tell the American people about that? I mean, sir, I, I obviously know Mr. Riley well. I think he's an honorable man. I don't know at what point this rose to his level, the issue with the aircraft. He was chief of operations. Right. But I, again, I don't know at what point this came from our aviation division into the chief of operations. And, and If it didn't, that would be a problem, right? And that is possible, sir. How do you excuse yourself from this when... Again, I, I don't have a sufficient answer for you. Uh, that's right, and, and, and I think that's a very candid answer. I think it's a very accurate answer. It's a question we're asking, and I, we've got to figure out how to figure this out because this whole page of people are making tens of thousands of dollars in bonuses, and we have an Inspector General report come out. It's not too rosy, and it's just terribly frustrating. The two recommendations that are outstanding, Inspector General, can you please articulate the two recommendations that haven't been agreed to or implemented, and why is there a conflict? There were, um, in the report uh, that we received from um, DEA, um, they had made uh, some steps towards implementing some of the actions they had uh, presented to us. Explain to me what the two are, and then maybe Mr. Patterson can say why the, DE, the DEA doesn't want to do that. Um, if you could give me one moment. Sure, sure. Sorry. Um, the, um, the two that um, we still have, um, we have as, by the way, resolved 
in that they have acknowledged the steps that they are going to take and need to take. So there is no outstanding. I, when I heard your testimony, I thought you said five of the seven had been implemented, but the remaining two, Correct. are they in the clear now? No. They're, they're the five are closed. What we call resolved are um, when a component here, the DEA, um, agrees to take the steps right. we have Are there any outstanding take, issues? And there are some as to those. Um, and um, what they involve are um, the recommendations about the long-term confidential sources review. Mm -hmm. um, and they have taken some steps to implement policies that would ensure the long-term reviews. Um, the issue there that we have identified or, the, or what we are waiting to see is that, in fact, there is a clear system in place for the timely review of those. Because one of the concerns we found in the 2015 review, and that is what we are talking about right now, was the DEA wasn't following its own policy that then existed. It certainly wasn't complying with the AG guidelines that were in place. Um, and uh, it wasn't clear to us still that they had a um, a measurable uh, timeline in place for how they were going to review long-term CIs and what the process okay. was. Okay. And the that other was issue? One. Um, the second one was um, in looking at the, the uh, FICA issue, the disability payment issue, to informants, which we had serious concerns about whether there was a legal basis to do that. We, uh, our recommendation was for the DEA to go back and evaluate whether there was a legal basis to do that. And our understanding is the DA is still working on that issue. Uh, can you, and so Mr. We Patterson, can you, can you illuminate us? My time has gone over here. But why is a confidential informant getting, getting benefits? So, uh, absolutely, sir. On, on the FICA payments issue, uh, a policy has been posted in, in extraordinary circumstances where an informant is performing a role as an informant and doing government work, they may be entitled to Department of Labor uh, review for FICA payments. Um, How many people are we talking about? A handful. I mean, I don't think actually we have had any in the last number of years. Um, I think these go back some time. Um, the issues were that we did not have a policy in terms of the, you know what the employees would even know what had to be presented to the Department of Labor. That policy has been posted on our human resources site. Um, the issue related to uh, the question of the legality has been worked with the Department. Um, we owe responses back, and I think it was essentially providing the proof of both of these things to the okay. IG. Thank uh, you. My time has expired. I will now recognize the gentleman from Alabama, Mr. Palmer, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I appreciate the witnesses being here, and good to see you, Mr. Horowitz, always. Um, your September 2016 audit highlighted widespread issues with the DEA's tracking and oversight of payments, the lack of receipts, a lack of information justifying payments to sources. Uh, these are issues that have been going on for a long time and, and were noted in, a, I think, a 2005 report. Can you tell us how long these issues have been around and, and, and why they have been so persistent? Well, it has clearly been, from our review, a long-term problem because we found analogous problems in our 2005 audit, and now we were seeing the same in 2015 and 16. Um, why it is occurring? It is, um, in the first instance, a system that isn't being implemented effectively. So, for example, mandatory fields that you are supposed to enter, an agent can just skip over them. There is no point at which, like when we all fill out forms online and it comes back and says, sorry, you can't go forward because this mandatory field needs to be filled in, there was no such stopgap with the DEA's file. So you had situations where sources were being input data, but key, issue, key data, like occupation, um, wasn't being always entered. Um, the system wasn't being accurately reported in terms of dollar payments we found in many instances. And so the, these are systemic failures of the system. Um, and then separately, we found that DEA hadn't put in place uh, policies, procedures, or practices that allowed headquarters-based oversight such that they could watch for these issues, supervise these issues, and make sure change was occurring. It was being left to the field offices to handle these. And some field offices we found were doing a good job. And some field offices were doing something very different. Well, you had some specific recommendations in your 
uh, July 2015 report, and I think in your testimony you said the DEA had only implemented five of seven of those. Um, is that, um, I mean, begs the question why the recommendations haven't been implemented yet, and does that uh, in any way reflect a, a, a resistance on the part of the DEA? I mean, why haven't they implemented all of them? Um, I don't think it reflects a, um, a resistance to them, because certainly our communications have reflected an interest and willingness mm -hmm. to do so. Um, I think, frankly, these have happened, as I said in my opening t statement, for such a long period of time, and you just mentioned as yeah. well. Um, they, not, they will require, and we expect, not just paper policies, but we will close recommendations when we see effective policies being actually implemented. So, Step one is a commitment to put the policies in place. Step two is, are they now being followed? Can we go in and look at them and say, yes, these are working, yes, these are being followed? The reason I ask that about the resistance is that Mr. Patterson's testimony, he said that all the recommendations had been implemented from that report, and, and your testimony indicates that five of seven um, uh, ha have been. That, so I, I'm just trying and to determine. I think determine. that was just an error on, uh, in terms of the terminology. Wait, if, if I, so as we put our testimony together, we, DEA has implemented those fixes. That doesn't mean that the IG has agreed with our implementation of those two being sufficient. So I, I apologize for that oversight. I did not mean to re make the reference that they were closed by the OIG, but that, in fact, DEA had, and as I just to explain to the chairman on the FECA matter. The other matter is the six-year review of the informants. Uh, there is still additional work that we can do on that. However, we are now in conformity with the AG guidelines uh, in terms of those reviews. I hope you can understand the frustration that, that some of us and maybe most of us on the committee uh, feel, in, uh, particularly in dealing with the DEA. Uh, it goes back to uh, the issue of, of the uh, sex parties in, in Colombia and the fact that those agents, and, and I think many of our opinions, were not um, punished severely enough. In fact, I think um, Mr. Horowitz, your report from March 2015 indicated that they received bonuses, which is in conflict with DEA policy. Uh, the chairman has brought up the bonus paid uh, to the person in, in, uh, who has responsibility for the, for the uh, aircraft. And it's just hard to understand how an organization can operate and violate its, its own policies and do things that, that create so much uh, uh, bad publicity uh, uh, toward the agency and, and not, and not uh, impose any discipline. Uh, so I, I think uh, the, in regard to what we're trying to do here is we're trying to get the DEA in a position where uh, they're functioning with proper oversight where there's accountability and, and uh, transparency in the agency and, uh, and really want to see the agency implement the, the recommendations of the OIG. I yield back. Thank the gentleman. We we'll now recognize the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Duncan, for five minutes. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Patterson, uh, the staff, uh, the committee staff has provided us with uh, information that says DEA Intelligence Division could not provide DOG DOJ OIG with an accounting of its sources are the total amounts paid to CSs. And it says that um, OIG identified nine confidential sources, eight of which were paid $25 million between fiscal year 2011 and 2015. One source has received $30 million over 30 years. Could, could that be accurate that uh, the DEA has been paying one confidential source uh, um, what averages out to a million dollars a year? It is, sir. And uh, I, I guess a lot of people would wonder how they could qualify for that kind of uh, job. Um, it's, that's, that seems uh, ridiculously excessive uh, to me to, to uh, reward a, a drug dealer a million dollars a year. But uh, uh, and th then there were payments of over $800,000 to an Amtrak employee who uh, over 20 years, of 40 something thousand a year, and that he was uh, he was later fired for violating uh, Amtrak uh, ethics rules, and he's being investigated for the IRS uh, uh, for not paying taxes. Uh, do you, are you familiar with that case? I am, sir. Uh, did, did you hear Mr. Horowitz when he said a while ago that uh, they didn't feel that there was uh, 
adequate information to determine uh, the success and failure rate, and he couldn't tell whether you were batting a thousand or batting a zero point five zero. Did you hear that? I absolutely did. And and what would be your response to that? Again, I I agree with their their assessment of that, and we are working to fix those issues. Uh, do you anticipate that uh, this? Um, $237 million that's been paid over the last five years is, is going to, uh, it, it, that you're going to continue those types of payments at, at that type of level or, or increase it or decrease it? I mean, obviously, those, those numbers have the ability to change. That funding is not all appropriated, sir. Um, I will simply say this, that related to fundings of informants, we have to have good accountability and oversight on what these people are paid. We have to be good stewards of how we spend this money. Uh, and we are going to do a better job of ensuring that that, in fact, is happening both in the field division with our headquarters elements and through the inspections process. We've already put that word out to the employees that this is not a, a kind of voluntary change that we're doing. We're going to look much harder at these programs and inspect them more thoroughly. Well, would you be willing to give the committee detailed information as to as to people who are receiving uh, payments like a million dollars a year? Sir, I'd absolutely, in fact, in, on those programs, and I've already informed staff, uh, there are briefings that we could provide outside of, of the public forum with proper clearances on those programs. They have been done in the past. I recognize that people have changed over and staff and members uh, be more than happy to come back and brief you on those programs. I was a, a lawyer and a judge. I was a judge for seven and a half years before I came to Congress trying the felony criminal cases. And I've dealt with many, many cases involving uh, uh, large-scale drug dealers. And I can tell you, I think that uh, paying any confidential informant uh, at the rate of a million dollars a year is ridiculous. It's very excessive. And I'm, I am very disturbed that that type of thing is going on uh, I, d I just don't uh, see how that could be justified or worthwhile in any respect. Thank you very much. Thank the gentleman. We'll now recognize the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Gowdy, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Inspector General Horowitz, I want to see if I can get you to help me a little bit. You have, you have a background as a, a very distinguished prosecutor, if my memory serves me correctly. I was a prosecutor. I'll leave it to others to decide how distinguished. I think you were very distinguished. Well, why does law enforcement need informants? Uh, they're critical to the effort to um, get into organized crime, drug rings, other organized criminal activity, because um, the, the best information is gathered from the inside of the, of the, of the crime families or structures. Yeah, I remember trying to get some first grade uh, and kindergarten teachers to help me in some of my drug prosecutions, but they didn't know anything about the drug ring. So sometimes you have to use people who are actually part of it. But there's a difference between someone working off charges and someone working for money. Correct. Help the jury understand why you would, why you need both and what the difference between the two is. Well, on a defendant who's been arrested who wants to cooperate, the, the law, the sentencing guidelines, and policies in place incentivize cooperation as, an, as a way to work off a potential sentence. So judges are informed, and judges then decide what benefit value to give to the individual who cooperates, and that is in the form of a reduced sentence, or in some instances, no jail sentence that they might otherwise have faced. For a non-defendant, whether it's a citizen who has not engaged in wrongdoing or someone who may be involved in wrongdoing but has never been charged, um, the payments are designed to incentivize them to report on information, provide information that there is no, uh, oftentimes no other leverage to get, although, as I said earlier, for most individuals, if they see wrongdoing and it's public, the hope would be that they would come forward and report on it rather than need to be paid to do that. Can you think of an example where you would use a paid informant to gather information that would be available via subpoena or search warrant? Um, not off the top of my head as I sit here. 
Do you recall the line of cases beginning with Giglio? I do. What's Giglio? So Giglio and its progeny require prosecutors, the government, um, federal or state, to provide defendants with information that would tend to exculpate them, to allow the defense to argue they're not guilty, but also separately to impeach the credibility of government witnesses at trial proceedings or other court proceedings. For instance, if we were to confer a benefit on a source, a confidential source, that would need to be disclosed to the defense attorney, the defense team. Correct. How do you do that with subsources? Um, that was our very serious concern, particularly if you don't even know who they are and you are, have no policies or controls in place to identify them or understand what their conduct they're engaged in. It strikes me as a serious issue, or, or I mean, you have that issue, or if there's no expectation of litigation, no expectation that a charge is ever going to be leveled or a, or a prosecution is ever going to be undertaken, then maybe you don't have to worry about Giglio. Do you have a sense in looking at this whether or not arrest and prosecution were the ultimate objectives of the employment of some of these informants, or was it just simply information gathering? Based on what we were told, our understanding was these were for the purposes of advancing criminal investigations. We did not go down the road and see who ultimately was arrested and what cases were brought, but it was very clear to us that these were to advance criminal drug investigations. So if the objective is to one day wind up in a courtroom with charges um, and hopefully a conviction, then how do you get around the use of subsources where you cannot meet your obligations under Giglio? That was precisely our concern. Do you still have that concern? We do. If you shared it with DEA, what, um, what did they do to assuage your conscience? Well, that's one of the things we're waiting to hear back from next month in their first report following our September audit. Would you let Chairman Chaffetz know what you, I, I have a world of respect for law enforcement, as I know you do too, but if the objective is an arrest and a successful prosecution and you have constitutional requirements under Brady and Giglio, I don't know how you do that with the use of subsources where the prosecutor either doesn't know or doesn't know enough. I, I don't know how you do that. Right. That's precisely our concern, and there were, I might add, several other areas where we were concerned as to whether the, what was going on in practice impacted and how it impacted the necessary constitutional disclosures that needed to be made to the defense about a wide variety of activity. We talked about the disability payments. It's not clear to us, in fact, it, it appears to us that that information, if those individuals ever ended up in court, wasn't widely known and therefore in all, most all likelihood wouldn't have been fully disseminated. Other activities of tipsters and other limited use sources that resulted in criminal cases may or may not, unclear, but may, or, but may be relevant to that decision. And there didn't seem to be a system in place for anybody to, in fact, make that assessment. Well, I know I'm out of time, but in addition to making life very uncomfortable for prosecutors who have to appear before judges and explain why they didn't turn over certain information, you also run the risk of whatever convictions you gather being overturned because of a discovery abuse. So I, I hope that you get the answers to your questions and that if uh, you're able to, you'll share the results with Chairman Chaffetz. Can you, before the gentleman yields back, could the gentleman yield? Of following course, up on, to the on, chairman, yes. Uh, following up on Mr. Mr. Gowdy's question, of the $230 plus million dollars over five years that was paid, do you have a sense or precision on what percentage or which dollars went to these so-called sub-informants? And the second part of that is, what did, what did the American taxpayers get? Do, do we have, are there any metrics on convictions, drug seizures? Like, what did we get for $237 million? Um, taking that last question first, that, that was, in fact, one of the challenges that we faced in looking at these um, payments. It wasn't clear to us, um, and you couldn't connect, and in fact, the database oftentimes wasn't accurate, 
um, to figure out where those payments went and what they resulted in. It is an issue we are looking at actually right now on the asset seizure review that we are doing. Um, is a similar question has been raised, similar issues have been raised about um, interdictions. Yes, we know about the successful seizures, um, but where did that lead? What did that lead to furthering a criminal investigation? Did it lead to an arrest? How many unsuccessful interdictions were there? In other words, how much was the public's privacy being impacted? Or civilians who are being asked questions at train stations, bus stations, airports um, that don't ultimately have drugs or, or cash, um, how many of those events occurred? And I think all of those are weaknesses in the data collection effort that is going on. Mr. Patterson, how do you answer those questions? Again, I, I agree with Mr. Horowitz's concerns. Uh, we are working on properly staffing and uh, reviewing a number of these issues at the headquarters level, making sure that the data that is getting into our system is proper. Related to the, the, the other member's question related to the subsources, we are working with our other Federal partners to find out how they are dealing with those specific issues and subsource uh, related cases. Um, so, again, we are. So, do you or do you not have a database? If you, you get $50,000 to pay off some informants, you can't tell me there is a database. I could go to line whatever 237 and say, well, this is what happened? Sir, we, we do have a headquarters database, a centralized database uh, in which we track this. Um, is Mr. Horowitz. So, what are the metrics? Where, where is this? But I think it is the, the absence of the negative, right? In, in terms of we would have to go to specific case files in the field if it is available to see, you know, we, we made three other attempts at, at looking at information and saw nothing. That is essentially guidance that we are putting out to the field that we have to collect this information as well. So, you have, I am still confused. Do you have data or not have data on how many convictions, seizures, those types of things? Do you, you don't, you can't related, produce a sum to total the, of that? Related to the specific payments, yeah. there needs to be proper justification for why those payments were made. That doesn't necessarily capture the totality of the circumstances, and I think that's the issue that they've presented, and that's something that we're. So w on. when you say you're working on, come on, you're the senior management. You are the senior management. So how long have you been working on it, and when are you going to have it? Well, we started to have these discussions. I think probably over the summer, um, we started to immediately work on the limited use uh, issues because, quite frankly, to me. They are more important than capturing this data. And I am not trying to say that anything is, you know, one thing outweighs the other, but I think there are some significant issues in the limited use, especially when it comes to Fourth Amendment issues that, that raise to, to get those issues addressed in front of this. Um, but again, we are working, and I know the administrator is committed to doing this, is, is to getting this right in terms of making sure that we have the data, because we also need to evaluate, and as I said earlier, to be good stewards of how we pay this money. So we need to be able to balance those out internally as well. As I said, we have the Office of Inspections now going out, and it's, to me it is really about accountability and oversight, both in field managers and from headquarters. Well, look, law enforcement is usually pretty good about bragging when they get a big seizure or an arrest or conviction. We, just have, we don't have any metrics to compare the quarter of a billion dollars to what? Right. Well, I mean, I think the, the issue that I was trying to refer to wasn't Look, I, we are seizing more than, than we are spending, right? I mean, that's. I don't know that. How do I know that? Well, we have statistics on, on essentially. Well, where are they? Can I get them? Yeah. I mean, I have no, no concerns about providing those to the committee. I will take them back and ask to get that provided to you. Okay. And, uh, you know, from our standpoint, I think, our, I, I think the, the, the information shows that the seizures exceed the quarter of a billion dollars in informant payments. Um, although I think there's a challenge in matching the payments to the seizures, and so the, the right. macro numbers don't completely answer the question. The other issue that's, of course, a significant concern is if you incentivize a um, Amtrak employee or a airplane employee or a cargo company employee, if you seize money, we will give you a reward. How many boxes are they opening? How many passenger manifests are they providing? How many people are getting pulled out of line to find the person or persons that, that a seizure results in an award? As I said earlier, is it they are very good at it and so they are batting close to 1,000, or is it they are just picking as many people as they think fit a generalized profile such that 
they're batting near zero. But they're finding a few, and so they're getting right. good cash awards. All right, we've gone way past. Let's recognize uh, the, the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Grothmer, for five minutes. Okay, for Mr. Horowitz, um, you reported your relationship the, uh, that the relationships created by the DEA with limited use confidential sources went beyond that of a person who provides tips, but rather to people who are acting almost on behalf of or in partnership with DEA, giving them real-time information. In some cases, the DEA compensation was greater than they were getting in their regular job. Um, what privacy concerns would DEA essentially treating these sources as independent contractors uh, and asking them to perform specific tasks do you see? Well, the most significant one is the potential Fourth Amendment issue and the privacy interests that are at stake, um, given what they are, what having been categorized as limited use, they're supposed to be individuals who are simply on their own voluntarily tipping the DEA to information when what we see here are multiple payments and even direction being given to those individuals on what information to provide, who to provide it on, et cetera, that it, it could easily be seen that they are, in fact, an arm of DEA and an agent of DEA as opposed to a pure voluntary tipster as what I think the limited use category was intended to be, at least as we understood it. Yeah, we will give you a more specific example. Um, it appears the DEA had one confidential source working in the partial in parcel industry, and they were opening up uh, packages, and if they found uh, cash, they were alerting DEA. Now, I assume if you were a DEA employee, you couldn't sit there and, you know, without a warrant or something, just open up packages. Furthermore, and something that was kind of a little interesting in this specific instance, they'd call if they found cash, but they never happened to find drugs, which seemed a little bit suspicious. So I wanted your comment on that. It is a serious concern be for the, precisely for the reason um, you indicated. Um, I think there are two competing issues here, right? The public wants two things to be occurring. They, want, they don't want to see drugs or illegally transmitted currency being transmitted through these processes, but they also want to make sure that people are following the constitutional rules, laws, and procedures, and that everybody's privacy and expectations when they send a package through the mail aren't invaded simply in a rummage or search by someone who is looking for a cash reward um, with little control over them. And, and that is the problem that we saw here. Do you think as a practical matter they are they're hiring people or they are giving payments, sometimes payments more than a person's salary, uh, to do something that would be unconstitutional if their own employees did it? They are potentially incentivizing individuals to essentially act as their arm, raising that Fourth Amendment issue, as you indicated. Okay. Well, uh, switch gears a little bit. Your uh, September 2016 audit highlighted widespread issues with the uh, DA's tracking and oversight of payments. A lot of these issues have been going back, uh, are similar to those that were happening in a, in a report that was issued in 2005. So we have had an 11-year period here, and we are still finding the same issues. Could you comment on that? Yeah, that was a, a concern to us and obviously something that um, should have been uh, long ago addressed. Um, and it, it cascades into a whole series of issues. It, it, um, limits, um, as Mr. Patterson said, the ability of management at headquarters to understand how their program is working and whether it is working well. Um, it prevents or, uh, or affects the ability of the DEA and the agents to provide accurate, accurate and full information to prosecutors so they can fulfill their constitutional responsibilities if they are prosecuting somebody. Um, it uh, limits the ability of the public and through reports to Congress and, and the work that we do to understand whether its money is being used wisely and consistent with the parameters of, of what is permissible and not permissible. Okay. Well, that's Mr. Peterson kind of going off the same, uh, same line of questioning. What your comments are that we seem to have the same problems in 2016 as were identified 10 years ago, 11 years ago? That is correct, sir. So we have a computerized database that is about five years old that did not exist back in 2005. It resides at headquarters. 
uh, during their review and frankly during our current reviews, we're seeing that not all information is filled in. We now have a headquarters review uh, by individuals that work in operations management to ensure all those fields are in fact filled in. It seems like a relatively simple thing. Uh, again, it, it needs to be done better and, and we need to ensure that it's happening. Thank you much. I see my time has expired. Thank the gentleman. Now I'll go to the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Hurd, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman. And I'd like to pick up on, um, on Mr. Grothman's line, lines of questioning. And uh, let me preface by um, I spent the majority of my adult life managing sources in the CIA. Now it's different. It was foreigners and it was overseas. And, and my question is, how do you not have a receipt for a payment? And, and let's start with you, uh, Mr. Patterson. So the, the issues, and, and I don't have a full understanding of the actual the missing receipts for payments. Uh, I think it was the accounting. Um, I, I don't know if it was actually missing receipts, but the accounting that they were able to look at. Um, I would like to follow up, certainly, with my counterpart uh, to come across that it shouldn't be possible. Um, the question is, is it physically a missing form? Uh, I don't believe that it would be possible. That Mr. Horowitz, do you have any perspective on that? Yeah, I think, you know, from our standpoint, it was missing data, missing information that we couldn't confirm because of the absence of the document. It doesn't mean the document wasn't perhaps created earlier and lost, but we don't know. I think it's fair to say it's the challenge we had in, in working through the system and in understanding what was missing and how did we, how do we learn what is going on here? So do, do you, do, Mr. Horowitz, do you feel that um, within the DEA that there is a clearly established criteria to be used to determine whether money being paid to a confidential source was valuable or worth it? No, I don't think that that was going on, that that was one of the issues, that there were success payments for successes, but beyond that there weren't evaluations going on of how many misses there were, how many times were packages open, how many times were people pulled out of line that resulted in and, 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 and where you use those examples, pulled out of line, uh, going to package, is that because we're talking specifically about limited use? Or is this the payments to people that are trying to infiltrate some of these gangs and, and these criminal organizations? Many of the issues we found were in the limited use category. So these, that's where we saw over and over again our, our area of concern on this issue in particular. Separately, the subsources um, may have been in a different category. Um, much more like what you're suggesting, which were more uh, traditional criminal um, use of, of those individuals that present a, a slightly different issue. Um, Mr. Patterson, do you feel that DEA has a clear criteria on what is a successful use of a, a limited use confidential source? Just specific to limited use? Yeah. Um, so, look, there's a number of issues related to limited use. One is obviously direction. Uh, that is a definition that we are working with our chief counsel to get out to the employees. It, is, it has got to be a one-way flow of information. Uh, we've made our employees aware of that, but again, we need to get the policy correct on this. Um, in terms of payments to the individuals, you know, that is directed, and, and although limited use requires a, a lower level of oversight for establishment, those now informants fall under the same policy as all informants. So the, the DEA officer that is involved in the recruitment of limited source, um, are, are promotions based on the number of sources you recruit, whether it's any limited use or not? No, sir. Um, what, is, what is the criteria for moving up the, the chain? Uh, for promotion yes. within DEA? Promotion is, is obviously based on performance, and depending at what levels that are, are done, there is also additional testing that's done. So is it number of arrests, the amount of uh, dope you get off the streets? Are, are, the, are there any issues like? No, we, I mean, the current administrator has made it very clear that we do not use a, a metrics-type system for promotions, that our, our mandate is to essentially work the biggest and best cases. Um, so how does headquarters evaluate the approval process? to go forward with the recruitment of a source, whether it's limited or not. How does headquarters validate that? Mm -hmm. So in the field, when they essentially complete the, the uh, um, not the request, the uh, establishment paperwork, that is reviewed at the headquarters level uh, and then is assigned a number back to the field. And, and, and is these criteria not used? What, what criteria are being used to determine whether money should be spent in order to run that source? 
So that is, again, administered at the field level up to a certain dollar amount. Uh, and again, as I started to explain on the limited use, although there is less oversight in the establishments of these individuals, the financial pieces of this all have the same regulations, which right. is there are certain approval levels that are able to happen in the field. And once they exceed a certain amount. And there's not, so, so the problem, Mr. Horowitz, that you're seeing is that there's not a connection between when there is a payment back to what the criteria that was originally used to authorize that payment. I think what we're, we have a couple of concerns based on what we see is that there's really no measurement beyond did you make a seizure and did you get an award um, beyond or, or are you sending us leads that never panned out? Right? Does this informant send us 1,000 leads and one pans out, or yeah. 10 leads and 10 pan out? The other part of it is um, we are um, concerned that when they did their, in the past at least, when they did reviews of long-term sources, when they had committees get together to look at these individuals who got large dollar amounts or were in place for long periods of time, we saw that they were spending less than a minute per source per review, which obviously is not a serious review of that. Now, we have seen changes that have occurred since we issued our audit um, in the last two years in that regard. That was several years ago. But that was indicative, I think, of, of a significant concern for precisely the reason you indicated. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And to now recognize the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Carter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank both of you for being here. Um, Gentlemen, I'm a lifelong health care professional, a pharmacist. I've um, I, I practiced pharmacy for over 30 years and have owned and operated um, my own pharmacy. So I, I, I know about the laws and the regulations that pharmacists must comply with in order to handle or dispense controlled substances. And this includes licensing and it includes inspections of pharmacies that are conducted by the DEA. Without a proper license uh, and without a DEA number, pharmacists can't practice. We can't um, dispense controlled substances, and, and I certainly understand that and certainly have experienced that. Mr. Horowitz, I'll, I'll start with you. Um, would you agree that there is a potential for a conflict of interest of whenever there is a licensee of the DEA, such as a pharmacist? A absolutely. And, and also acting as a confidential source for that same agency? That is correct. You would agree that is a conflict of interest? And in fact, it presents certainly a potential for that conflict. And in fact, in our, that was one of the concerns we found in our 2015 audit, that DA did not have those procedures in place. And actually, going back four years to our Fast and Furious report, we made that precise point with ATF because they were using FFLs as uh, sources of information and presenting in a different context the precisely the same issue that you have identified, Congressman. I, I, I can tell you it puts us in a precarious position. Um, for someone who controls my license, for someone who you know, controls my practice, uh, and, and here I am and all of a sudden I am a confidential source, that, that puts me in a very sticky situation. And, and as you pointed out, there, there, there was an audit in July of 2015 that, that the DEA did not have the proper controls and policies in place to ensure that there was no conflict of interest when a, when a, a, a license holder, and such as a pharmacist, was also a confidential source. The, the DOJ previously issued guidance to address this issue. Is that right? That is correct. Okay. Is, um, and it was after the ATF, as you mentioned, in Fast and Furious. That was after that happened. So has the DEA used the guidance issued by DOJ to develop policies and help control this conflict of potential conflict of interest? Our understanding is that since our report, they have now moved forward with those uh, procedures. Did you see the recommendations, Mr. Horowitz? Um, did you think that they were applicable and, and would offer for lack of a better term, protection to the licensee? Absolutely. It, it, it's particularly important that that be done for the reasons you indicated and what we saw before with ATF as well. Okay. Um, also, it is my understanding in this audit that, that DEA didn't have a special category to designate a, a confidential source to have a dual relationship as both a source and a licensee. Is that important? Is it important to have a, a 
a designation like that? It, it's critical because you want to make sure that supervisors all along the chain of command, including at headquarters, have the ability to make that assessment as they are first approving the source and then secondly as they are reviewing the use of the source. In both ways, you, you need that information or else you may not know who falls into that category. Right. So, Mr. Patterson, um, can you tell me the status of these concerns that were raised by the, the July 2015 um, audit um, of licensees such as pharmacists acting as, as confidential sources? As Mr. Horowitz just stated, so we have both, uh, both issues addressed and placed in policy. Uh, I would be more than happy uh, to get that policy to you if you would like to look at it yourself. Has it been implemented? It has been, sir. Okay, I would, if you don't mind, if you, if you could get those to us. I, I hope y'all can appreciate the precarious position this puts us in. Let me tell you, um, you know, the the pharmacies that my wife now owns, since I became a member of Congress, um, you know, we don't. Uh, we love the DEA and we love seeing the DEA, but we we just assume them not be in our stores, if, if you understand what I am saying. I mean, not, not that we have anything to hide, we don't, but at the same time, we have a great respect for someone who holds our license. And, and it is it, just a difficult situation if we are going to be put in that situation to be a confidential source like that. I mean, and, and we want to help. We want to do everything we can to cooperate. And, you know, more so than, than anyone, we want the bad guys caught, too. So, but it is just a very precarious situation, as I said before. Um, just very briefly, if you could, just how can the policy be enforced? Can it be enforced? The policies? The policies. Yes, certainly. Uh, in, in terms of our oversight internally to make sure that it is being applied uh, appropriately, absolutely. And we will do that with our, our Office of Diversion Control and with our Operations Management to make sure that is the case. Okay. Well, thank you again. Thank you both for this. And, and if you could get me those policies, I would appreciate it very much. Absolutely. Thank the gentleman. I have a few uh, follow-up uh, questions as, uh, as we conclude here. Um, and, Mr. Uh, Patterson, I appreciate the commitment that you are making on behalf of the DEA to be cooperative. On June 22nd of this year, in the Senate Judiciary Committee, Chairman Grassley, who has done exceptional work on this, uh, on this topic, um, he asked, when will the DEA confidential source policy be fully implemented? And he asked a few follow-ups directly on that same question. Mr. Rosenberg said that it had been finalized, and I am quoting, it has been finalized, it has been approved by the Department. I am more than happy to provide a copy to this committee and to your staff, sir. End quote. He went on and extrapolated uh, for this. But um, my understanding from Senator Grassley is they have not been given a copy of that policy, and we have not been able to see a copy of that policy. Is that something you are or are not able to provide to the committee? Yes, sir. Uh, I just asked. I mean, we have done in-camera reviews with staff, uh, and I don't know what staff, but I would be happy to let you know who, who it has been done with and, and follow up with you on that piece of information. And, and why? What is the justification for not allowing us, giving us a copy of that policy? Uh, that I don't know, sir, but I would be happy to find out what the justification is and also get that. What, what do you believe Congress should not be able to see? I, I, don't, I don't have any idea why that would have been done, so I would like to find out the proper answer to give to you as opposed to, to guessing. When you have the acting director committing to the Senate Judiciary Chairman that he can have it and then he's not given it, you see where that is a problem? Understood. You see, understand why I am going to have a problem if you don't give it to us? Understood. Have you seen it, Mr. Horowitz? Uh, one second. I, I have not personally seen it. We have, right? Yeah, we have seen it. Okay, so you give it to the Inspector General. That is good. Right. Um, when, will I, when will you get me that answer? I, I will get you that answer as quickly as possible after returning to the office. Do you understand that in camera is different than giving us a copy of that policy? I, I do understand that. And you understand that we are not going to be satisfied with an in camera review? You are making that very clear. Okay. Thank you. Um, Mr. Horowitz, give us perspective here. You know, within the Department of Justice, there are other law enforcement agencies who do deal with 
confidential informants, the FBI, for instance. Are there totally different policies, procedures, and implementations between these agencies, even though they are all within the Department of Justice? And why are they not taking best practices and making them uniform across agencies? That is an excellent question, Mr. Chairman, oh, and one Just a little that, closer. Sorry. That is an excellent question and one that we have asked repeatedly, because you are right. If you look at the three components that deal the most with informants, which is FBI, DEA, and, and ATF, they have varying policies, even though there are the Attorney General guidelines on the use of informants. And in just the four and a half years I have been the IG, we have now issued two reports finding that two of those three components were not in compliance with the Attorney General guidelines. As you well know, Four years ago in the Fast and Furious report, we made that finding with regard to ATF. And in last year's July 2015 report, we made that clear as to DEA as to the categories we were looking at. Um, and obviously that is a concern. And while there should be supplemental and differences in the policies, given some of the unique uses of informants for each of those agencies, for example, the FBI has a very robust intelligence program and other needs. The DEA obviously has um, much more foreign uses and, and, and international reach and other issues. ATF, obviously, again, many localized issues. So each should be particularized. But it has been a question we have and will continue to raise exactly what you just indicated, which is why aren't there consistent overarching principles and procedures and policies all across the multiple components. Now, we are seeing that in response to our reports, our first Fast and Furious report, the follow-up Fast and Furious report, the two audits we have done here. We are seeing more of a centralization, but that is something that we continue to push for, actually, not only in this area, but in several other areas as well. Yeah. And, and, and I, I guess that is part of the point, uh, Mr. Patterson, to carry back to the DEA as a whole. It doesn't, this is not a start from scratch project. You know, this is, you're not necessarily blazing uh, new trails and ground that it has already been tilled here. You can, you can actually, you know, learn. And somehow we need the Department of Justice to kind of coordinate. That's why they're all within one. We have one attorney general who could say, look, here are you can solve 80, 90 percent of this with best practices, and these are the tools and the mechanisms and the software, quite frankly, in order to track and do these types of things. And I don't expect you to respond to that other than to say it would be encouraging to know that we are getting some economies within the Department of Justice. If I could sure, actually sure. respond to it, I mean, and hopefully this will be a piece of good news, we are actively working with both the Bureau and the other components right now to look at those best practices, especially when it comes to subsources and other categories that we have struggled with. Okay. So that, right. that process is already underway. Very good. Um, let's go back to the $1.5 million, I believe the number is, that was paid to TSA employees and, Am and, and Amtrak, I don't know if it's employees or employee. Uh, let's first go to Amtrak. What, what were we paying off? What, what were we getting for that money? I believe it was $800 plus thousand dollars went to one Amtrak employee over a course of 20 years. Um, what did we get for that? What was he giving you or she giving you on a monthly, daily, whatever basis it was? Uh, the individual is, is providing information related to suspicious travel, uh, last-minute purchases of tickets, other things that would raise to that level um, over the course of that 20 years. Um, but, but why do you have to pay for that to an individual? Why not go to Amtrak and say, look? So I don't have the good answer for why this started back in the 90s. Uh, what I can tell you is, is that this practice has been stopped. Uh, we have clear guidance that this is not permitted uh, for both quasi-government and government employees, that there is no payments to be made uh, if they are performing as a, an individual providing information that they should be doing in their daily job. Um, so it is fixed moving forward. I, I don't feel like I have a satisfactory answer. I know we have engaged with Amtrak. Uh, to try and acquire this information. That is still a work in progress. Uh, you know, I don't think it's as simple as, uh, you know, 
having access to information. I think it's, it's knowing more about that. And like I said, we're working on that currently with Amtrak. Uh, let's go to the TSA. What, what, how many TSA employees were you paying off? I believe it, uh, I think it was a total of eight had been established at some point. I think two or three of those individuals ultimately received payments. I know there is a ongoing investigation uh, by the OIG, which I, I, I don't believe we would how, comment on. I, this is a significant amount of money to TSA, right? How, many, how much money went out the door to TSA employees? I think it was, uh, I don't know the exact figure, sir. It was in the $50,000 to $100,000 range, I believe. Inspector General Horowitz, do you have any? Can you illuminate this anymore? I'm just looking for the precise number. Um, so I guess uh, staff is telling me the number is about eighty-four thousand dollars paid to three different people. Yep. What were the TSA employees providing the DEA surreptitiously? I believe it was information related to seizures of currency. Yeah. Seizures of currency. Right. Information related to, to passengers. These were screeners uh, with TSA, not law enforcement personnel. That was the weakness in our policy, quite frankly, is it dealt with law enforcement uh, individuals. Um, and I said, again, that, that practice has been stopped uh, and it's clear in policy. Okay, so since it's stopped, we can talk about what had happened. So when they were finding currency, they would go to the DEA and say, hey, I found some currency, give me some cash? My understanding, they were being asked if they saw currency as you went through an x-ray to tip the DEA to that so they could follow up on it afterwards. And of course, that's a potentially, depending on how it's arranged, wholly inappropriate use of the entire screening system that's been put in place in this country and raises, again, Fourth Amendment issues as to who they worked for. Did those individuals, were they incentivized through the payments to be DEA, arms of DEA, and be supporting criminal investigations? Or were they there in a public safety role to protect the flying public? So where is this? Where the reason why I, I hesitate is because I know there is an ongoing OIG investigation, and that's why I didn't, you know, I, I'm not familiar with their investigation. We'll obviously look at any administrative impacts that come at the completion of, of that investigation. So is it fair to say, Inspector General, that there is an ongoing Inspector an OIG investigation into this? We are continuing to review that and through our investigations. And is the Inspector General for Homeland Security involved in that, or is this just coming through DOJ? He is aware of that, and we've been in communication as of our teams on all of these issues. So I'm trying to figure out who did something wrong and who's going to be held accountable for that and what were the implications? I don't right. Well, we, you know, we've certainly, for example, on the Amtrak um, matter, we work closely with the Amtrak OIG to move forward and uh, look at that matter, and we're doing the same on the Homeland Security side with our counterpart at OIG there. Um, and we'll hold accountable, as we always do, are the, the individuals that we find engaged in wrongdoing, whether criminal or non-criminal. Um, criminal obviously goes through a judicial process, administrative, non-criminal. We would report back to DEA for their handling on administrative matters. Um, to Mr. Patterson, I, I want to ask you here, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, an article by Alan Judd of November 28th, Sex, Drugs, and the DEA, Atlanta Agent Accused of Improper Conduct, um, an Atlanta-based supervisor allegedly having a sexual relationship with two DEA confidential informants. Uh, and arranged for the agency to pay one of them some $212,000. Um, Senator Grassley, again, has been leading out on this, and like, hats off to his good work and him and his staff. Um, where is this investigation, and what's, what's being done about this? Again, this was an investigation in which we had gone to 
uh, OIG, it had come back to DEA. We began the investigation as we did. We found issues that rose to criminal, uh, potential criminal charges. We went back to OIG. They've been handling that part. I, I will tell you, though, sir, and, and outside of that, and I'll leave that to Mr. Horowitz to discuss if he can, uh, we've held managers accountable as well as people below them uh, in this particular instance. You've done what with them? We, we've investigated and held managers accountable. When you say held them accountable, how did you hold them accountable? Well, ultimately they resigned, uh, but they were being investigated by the Office of Professional Responsibility for their role in oversight. How many people resigned? Uh, the individual. We had uh, an agent, a uh, task force officer, returned to his or department, and then a, uh, a grade 15 retire from DEA. So he gets full benefits, he's not prosecuted, so you just let him go, you didn't, no prosecution. It, it's not criminal in nature for him. I, I will also say one other thing is the employee was uh, put out on suspension without pay during the course of the investigation. How long had he worked for the DA? I, if you had to guess. Sit here. Yeah, I, I think it's about 15 years. I, again, I can find that out. Well, you. look, I, again, this is a tough thing because the, the men and women 9,000 plus employees, is I take it right? Uh, they do a, a good, hard, decent, um, patriotic job. They put their lives on the line, and we're immensely grateful. But you do have bad apples, as we do um, in every department and agency, quite frankly. A bigger agency, this is going to happen. I mean, just human nature, the, the odds are the, the bigger the department and the agency, you're going to have more and more bad apples. It's just a just reality of it. Um, but it is important that. I feel very strongly and passionately of the idea that you need to hold people accountable and you do need to, they do need to have uh, consequences. And I worry that it's all too often in the federal government they just walk away. Uh, you know, go ahead and retire, get your full benefits, pat you on the back on the way out when you've done something really dramatically wrong. And, um, and in some cases it is criminal, so other parts it's not. But um, I want people to be held accountable and I want the other 9,000 people who do, do it by the book and do do it right to know that when somebody does step over the line, there are consequences and not just, hey, you know, go ahead and retire and, um, you know, move on. I, that's, that seems to fall far short of the proper justice that, that should be required. So, um, listen, we, we appreciate, again, please carry back the... Uh, how much we do appreciate the DEA and the tough work that they do. To the Inspector General, uh, you've got a wonderful staff. They do hard work over, in this case, close to three years. Um, but let, let's also make sure that, you know, this was done 10 years ago and we didn't learn the lessons and implement that. I don't want to come back again and f only to find out that with a change of administration or change of personnel that this gets forgotten about. And uh, I think that's incumbent upon us. Uh, to continue to ask you about it and make sure that the progress uh, continues. But it's also just the best practice to make sure that the future generation of people that are working um, at the DEA have the proper support, the resources, uh, the policies to protect themselves, um, but also to make sure that the agencies be in the premier agency that we need it to be. So again, to the Inspector General, I Please know how much I appreciate your staff, and I know they beat their head on frustration trying to get things, but I am very pleased to hear, uh, Mr. Patterson, about the, the progress and cooperation. Um, that's very, very encouraging and very much appreciated. So we thank you both for the work, and this uh, hearing now stands adjourned.